We can't be involved in fornication or covetous. For example, he makes that very clear. He says, let it not be named one time among you as become saints. He says very clearly that you have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ, of God, if this is your lifestyle. If you're engaging in these actions, you are not going to go to heaven. That's very clear. That's, that's, there's no doubt about that. And I love what he says in verse 6. He says, let no man deceive you with vain words. Don't let anybody uh, try to sugarcoat this. Don't let anybody try to tell you otherwise. You know, there's a lot of people that try to deceive people with vain words. That word vain means empty. And so Paul says there shouldn't be any discussion about this because this is how it is. It's not going to change. This is very clear. It's very evident. we got a lot of people today in the world that try to deceive people with vain words, don't they? They try to deceive people with empty words and tell them, oh, well, you know, you know it doesn't really matter. God's not, surely God wouldn't judge you for this, or surely God wouldn't send somebody to hell for this, or surely God would accept you as you are, or, you know, there's really nothing wrong with that. We hear that a lot, don't we? And when we hear that people are trying to convince or uh, uh, deceive other people with vain words, with empty words, Paul says, don't let that happen. Because these things are clear they are, are true. And he says, For because of these things cometh the wrath of God on the children of disobedience. Because of these actions. Because of this sin. And then in verse 7 he says, You don't partake with them. That word partake means to participate. And yes, it also means to be involved in those actions. But as we're going to discuss in a little bit, it can also mean when you defend these actions. Partake with them. He says to reprove them or expose them. Verse 11, he says, don't have any fellowship with it at all. It's sinful. These things are wrong. And you shouldn't have, you are light. You can't have any association with the darkness. Jesus Christ is light. He has no association with the darkness. The light reproves or exposes the darkness. And you can have no fellowship with that. Shine light on the evil deeds. Call it out as wrong. It's all these things. It's very clear what the Apostle Paul is trying to drive home here to the church at Ephesus. And so when we think about all that, and we think about this word tolerance, what does that word tolerance mean? What does it mean to tolerate something? Well, Webster defines the word tolerance he says, by tolerating or being tolerant, especially of views, beliefs, practices, etc., of others that differ from one's own. B says, freedom from bigotry or prejudice. To tolerate. Someone is different from you. They have a different viewpoint. They have a different mindset. Doesn't necessarily mean that you accept that, but it means that you, uh, you, you don't actively work against that. And the idea of tolerance, it's not a new one at all. This debate of tolerance goes back really hundreds of years. And you think about our country and you think about the founding of our country, it really was founded because of religious freedom. When the pilgrims, when they left England in the 1600s, they left because really of religious freedom. Uh, the king in the, in the 15 and 1600s in England, they were Anglican, of course. King Henry broke away from the Catholic Church and established the Anglican Church. The Pope wouldn't give him a divorce. Some of you may know about that. The Pope wouldn't grant him a divorce from his wife because and she wouldn't give him a male heir in his mind. He wanted to divorce her. The Pope said, no, you can't do that. So King Henry said, well, I'll just start my own church. And he did. He started his own church. It was called the Church of England or the Anglican Church. And if you were a citizen of England, and when you were born, you were baptized in as an infant into the Anglican Church. And so really everyone in England, you were a member of the Anglican Church by birth and by nationality. There wasn't any other option. But there was a group, there was actually several groups in England that realized that the practices of the Anglican Church weren't right. 
They don't want to be a part of that anymore. And they want to separate themselves. Matter of fact, they were called separatists. Well, in King Henry's mind, you weren't a patriot. You weren't, you weren't a loyal Englishman if you didn't want to be a part of the Church of England. Not only was it wrong religiously in his mind, but it was also wrong civilly, against the law. And so those people were expelled. They went to the, the Netherlands for a while, and eventually those pilgrims came to America seeking religious freedom. They wanted to, to practice their religion as they saw fit. And so when they came here, they came here for religious freedom because England was intolerant of their views. They were actively persecuting their views. You weren't allowed. You weren't allowed to exist as someone other than a member of the Church of England. It wasn't tolerated. It was persecuted. So they came to America. But you know, when they came to America, they did exactly the same thing. The Puritans and the Pilgrims, they did exactly the same thing. If you weren't in line with them doctrinally, guess what? They kicked you out. <laughs> of their uh, colonies. Massachusetts had very, stri very strict laws regarding religion. <laughs> and uh, Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson and others we can read about in history were expelled from the colonies, from the uh, Plymouth colony, because of their religious views. And so their religion wasn't tolerated. Not only was it not accepted, it wasn't tolerated. It was persecuted. They fought against them. Eventually, Maryland, the colony of Maryland, was found, and Maryland was a Catholic, was established as a Catholic colony to a large extent. And in 1649, they passed a law called the Act of Toleration. The Act of Toleration. And in 1649, this Act of Toleration basically said that uh, you could worship however you wanted to as a Christian. Well, that was, that was revolutionary. We're not going to persecute you we're not going to persecute you for practicing the Christian religion a little bit different than, uh, than we do. That was the government. The colony of Maryland passed that law. That's why it was called the Act of Toleration. Now, it didn't mean that, that everybody accepted everybody else's beliefs because they didn't accept their beliefs. But it did mean that you could actively engage in your religion, your worship, without being persecuted or kicked out by the government. There's a huge difference. That's why it was called the Act of Toleration. But you know what the Act of Toleration did in and of itself? If you deny the divinity of Jesus, it brought about the death penalty. You looked at that, but it was called the Act of Toleration. You don't believe in Jesus? You could die for that. You deny the divinity of Jesus. So it allowed religious freedom to some extent for Christian groups, but obviously not for everybody. But it was a foundational document, document because it did allow Christian religious practices across the board. And of course, eventually, what did our government do? Our government established the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, that granted religious freedom to anybody. Congress will make no law respecting an establishment or religion or the free exercise thereof. That was truly tolerant. You could believe whatever you wanted to in terms of religion. You didn't have to believe anything. There was going to be no persecution against you for believing something that was contrary to someone else or some other group or even what the government might endorse. And the government couldn't endorse anything about the First Amendment. That was a true act of toleration. It didn't mean that anything was accepted. That's a, that's a difference. It didn't mean that, that everybody accepted everybody else. But it did mean that you were free from persecution from the government for practicing that. And that's a difference because today, the definition of tolerance has changed. Today, what does tolerance mean? It means acceptance. If someone says you are intolerant, what they really mean is you're not accepting what they believe. And that's a change in what, the, what tolerance has always meant. Today, the new meaning, there's a man by the name of Thomas Hemlock, and he wrote a book called Insights on Tolerance. He actually wrote this in 1992. It's been a long time ago. But we're certainly seeing the fruits of it today. This is what he says. The definition of the new tolerance is that every individual's beliefs, values, lifestyles, and perception of truth claims are equal. There is no hierarchy of truth. Your beliefs and my beliefs are equal, and all truth is relative. Everything's the same. 
There's no difference at all in any beliefs. Your belief system is just as equal as my belief system. And uh, essentially, you should accept my beliefs, and I should accept your beliefs, and we should just go along uh, to get along. In the past, you might tolerate an activity without accepting it. You don't necessarily try to destroy it. You, you disagree with it, but you don't actively persecute it and work against it. But now, today, the new tolerance tells us that we must accept all beliefs and practices as equal. It doesn't matter what they are. No one is ever wrong. You've heard people talk about my truth. You hear people say that. Sometimes you see people put that on social media posts. Well, that's, I'm living according to my truth. Well, that is the culmination of this, this mentality. Your belief is just as, as strong as my belief. There is no truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Everything is relative. Everything depends on circumstance. Acceptance of others' lifestyle and choices must happen or you are an intolerant bigot. In today's day and time, it's a postmodern philosophy that's been around, really first came, came around this philosophy in the late 60s, and it certainly has taken root, and it is the dominant philosophy of today that affects everything, really, that happens in our society, it ha and it affects you and me in our day-to-day -day life, the things that we watch, the things that we see, the social media posts that we, that, we, that we look at, the memes, everything, advertising, everything is affected by this mentality. No absolute truth, no morality, no right or wrong. What is it? It's the whatever mentality. You heard people say that? Whatever? Doesn't matter. You be you, man. You do what you want to do, and I'll be me. And we'll all be all right. That's the new tolerance. Well, for those of us who are Christians, this worldview is totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. It couldn't be more contrary to what the Bible teaches. There is a standard of right and wrong, and that's the Word of God. And we know that and we understand that. God has given us this standard, His Word. And it's the standard by which we're going to be judged. Jesus said in John the 12th chapter, he said, if those that don't accept me, there's one that's going to judge them. He said, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge them in the last day. You know, again, this idea of judging anyone, oh, well, don't judge me. That's, that's, that's that new tolerance. You can't judge me. But Jesus says, there's one that's going to judge you in the end. And that's the words that I have spoken. The new law of liberty is going to judge you in the end. That is the standard by which we're going to be saved or we're going to be lost. And the Bible identifies certain things as sinful, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Absolutely. Sin is the transgression of God's law, according to 1 John 3 and 4. And if the Bible identifies an action as sinful or wrong, it's wrong. It doesn't matter your opinion about it. It doesn't matter my opinion about it. That is the truth. What Paul wrote here about fornication, about covetousness, about foolish talking, all those things that he says are wrong, we're not going to go to heaven if we engage in those. And you don't have to believe that. You don't even have to accept that. But it's the truth. It's the truth. And that's what's going to judge you. And that's what's going to judge me in the end. Sin is not going to be accepted by God. It's not going to be tolerated by God. You know why? You know why? Because sin is what put Jesus on the cross. Sin is what cost God his only begotten son. The Bible says in Hebrews 1 and 9 that Jesus loves righteousness, but Jesus hates iniquity. He hates sin. Hates it. That's the, one of the strongest words in the English language. Do you hate anything? Of course you do. There's some things that you hate. There's some things that you despise. It might be a food. It might be an action that some, someone else does, or maybe even you do occasionally. And there are things that you cannot stand. And you don't want to be anywhere around it. You detest it. What are synonyms for hate? Detest. Loathe. Is there anything you just loathe? 
Is there anything that just absolutely disgusts you and you don't want to see it? You don't want to smell it? You don't want to be around it in any way, shape, or form? It is just revolting to you? Of course there is. And that's the same for me. You know that's how God feels about sin. That's how Jesus feels about sin. He can't have anything to do with it. God is holy and righteous, and He can't have anything to do with sin. Let me tell you something. God will never tolerate sin. He has absolutely zero tolerance for sin. And you can't go to heaven if you have sin staining your life. And unless you're a Christian covered by the blood of Jesus, you do. You remember how that in 2 Peter 2 and 2, Peter describes one that has been sanctified by God that turned back to the way of the world. You remember Peter says there, it's like a dog returning to its vomit. That's disgusting, isn't it? I mean, that is disgusting to us. That's how God feels about sin. It dis he abhors it. He detests it. He hates it. You remember how Jesus described the church at Laodicea? He said to that church, he said, you're not hot and you're not cold. He said, you people are lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I am going to spew you out of my mouth. You know what that word spew means? It literally means to vomit. I'm going to throw you up. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because you disgust me. That's the picture of sin. He's not going to tolerate it in any way, shape, or form. That's God and that's Jesus' view of sin. Zero tolerance for it. And if we want to go to heaven, we've got to be covered by the blood of Jesus because that's the only thing that can take away our sin. That's the only thing that can make us pure in His sight is His precious blood. And the wonderful thing is, even though we've all been disgusting to God, we can all be washed and made clean in the blood of the Lamb. And that's why we're here this morning. That's why we rejoice. That's why we have hope. That's why we worship Jesus. Because He died to cleanse us and He did that stain. But you know, unfortunately, sometimes we develop a tolerance for sin in our own life. And part of it's, a lot of it's because the culture that we're living in, that mentality becomes our mentality sometimes, and we may not even be aware of it. But sometimes we start to accept things that the Word of God condemns. And so, with this context before us, I want to discuss some levels, what I believe to be our levels of acceptance or toleration of sin. You know, some people practice sin. They practice it. And when we think about the levels of acceptance, that's the top level. You are fully immersed in sin. You're practicing, you're practicing it. You're, uh, you're willingly accepting sin. You're engaged in an activity that's clearly condemned by Scripture. You are a fornicator, or you are a covetous man, as Paul condemns in Ephesians 5. You know it's wrong, but you simply don't care. You're fully engaged in it. We see this in the Gentile world that Paul describes in Romans 1. Turn over there with me to Romans, the first chapter. And let's read about individuals who are fully immersed in sinful lifestyle. Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Very familiar passage, probably to most of us. This, this describes the Gentile world, but Paul could just as well wrote this today. Romans 1 and 18, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Boy, that's us, isn't it? Hold the truth in unrighteousness. What are you talking about? That's what we just talked about. Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. In other words, you know better. But you don't care. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. 
Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was dark. So these people that Paul's describing, they know God. They know God exists. But they didn't glorify him as God. They didn't recognize his authority. They wanted to get away from him, and they did. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Man, that's the world we live in today. Isn't it? 30 different genders. Professing yourselves to be wise, you became fools. Don't know the difference in a boy and a girl. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man to birds, four-footed beasts, and creepy things. You know God, but you're making this little statue out of wood and you're calling it God. That's foolish. That's foolish. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness. God said, okay, if you're going to go that way, go that way. God's not going to force you to follow him. And he gave them up. God's not going to force you to follow him. He's not going to force me. He's going to let you go your own way if you want to go your own way. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. Postmodern philosophy. Truth is relative. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. You get to this point, you accept homosexuality, you accept anything, it doesn't matter. Rolling stone gathers no moss, right? You just keep on going. There's no boundaries. Nothing matters anymore. Nothing is wrong. You do whatever you want to do. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. I like that phrase. They didn't like to retain God. God's always there. But they didn't want to retain him in their knowledge. They knew about him. They didn't want to retain him. They didn't want to keep him in their head. So what they do? They put him out of their head. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate or debased mind to do those things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, <coughs> disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. These are individuals that have pleasure in sin. They have no remorse. They practice sin. They're fully engaged in it. They're fully accepting of sin. They have no problem with it. They know God. They change the truth into a lie. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They know the judgment of God, but they continue to practice these things because they simply don't care. Their will is more important than the will of God. They practice sin. They accept sin. They engage in sin. That's where they're at. But a second level of acceptance is those that promote sin. Those that promote it you know, there's individuals that promote things that are wrong but may not engage in it themselves. They may not regularly or necessarily practice or engage in a sin, but they fully accept it. They see no wrong in it whatsoever and they actively defend it or promote it. I don't think too many of us this morning are here. I really don't. You're here for a reason. You're spiritually minded to some extent. But you know, right here, it starts to get a little bit more fuzzy. You're not practicing it yourself, but do you ever defend it? You ever defend it? Romans 1 and 32 says these individuals, not only do they do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. 
Do some people, maybe they don't engage in that sin, but they glory or they pleasure in others that do that. They're proud of others that may be that way or do those things or engage in those things. They pleasure in sin. They may not be gay or transgender themselves, but they encourage that lifestyle. They may not smoke pot, but they advocate the, legis the legislation of marijuana. I don't smoke it, but you know, maybe it helps somebody. They may not attack somebody physically, but they encourage the seeking of vengeance. Oh, if he did that to me, I'd knock his block off. What are you doing? Well, you may not be punching them, but what are you doing? You're promoting that. You're defending that action. It's not right. It's wrong. What does Paul say in Ephesians 5, verse 7, 11? He says, you don't be partakers with them. You don't participate in it in any way. You don't have any fellowship with it in any way. You know, even doctrinally, this can happen with innovations in worship. We think about maybe instrumental music. Well, we don't practice that. We don't practice that, but do we promote that? Instrumental music and worship. Do we sometimes promote innovations? You think about that way, religiously speaking? That's true as well. Doctrinally, we've got to be pure. There's a lot of different levels of this. Turn with me to John, the 12th chapter. Let's look at a clear example of this. In John chapter 12, this is when Jesus is on trial. John chapter 12, beginning with verse 12. This is Jesus before Pilate. John 12 and 12. On the next day, I got the wrong, I got the wrong chapter. John chapter 20. Excuse me, 19. John chapter 19 and verse 12. John 19 and 12. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. So what happened? Pilate knows Jesus is innocent. He knows Jesus is not guilty of anything. Now the Jews want him dead. They took him to Herod. And they took him first to the council. The council had a trial there. They declared him guilty. Then they took him to Herod. Then they brought him back to Pilate. Pilate says, I don't see any wrong with him. I don't see any wrong with him at all. <coughs> From then, Pilate wouldn't let him go. But the Jews cried out saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not a friend of Caesar." Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. If you let Jesus go, you're not you're against the Roman government. You know what they're doing? They're not, they're not killing Jesus himself, are they? No, but they're encouraging it. They're promoting it. They're advocating it. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat of the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king, but they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. Would Pilate have killed Jesus? Would he have sentenced him to death without the Jews and the chief priests and the people crying out to crucify him? I don't think he would have at all. They were promoting his death. And because of it, they were just as guilty. Matter of fact, what they say, they said, let his blood be on us and our children. Remember that? They were just as guilty as the one that drove the nail in his hand. We can't promote sin. Sometimes we do. Thirdly, there are those that may not even may not even promote it, but they permit it. They permit it. Now these individuals don't practice actively sin. They may not even actively promote it, 
but they tolerate it in the old sense of the word. They're not fully accepting of it, but they go along with it. They don't necessarily think it's right, but they won't say it's wrong either. They're indifferent to sin. To each their own. You live your life, I'll live my life. It's the ultimate tolerant viewpoint. By refusing to condemn it, you allow it to go on and you allow it to continue. You know, we see this in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, with the man that was in an incestuous relationship. Turn, turn there with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's read about this man and how the church, they, didn't, they weren't endorsing what he was doing. They weren't even promoting it. But they were certainly permitting it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible says here, Paul writes, he says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as made among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. This man was married to his stepmother. His dad had died, and he married his dad's widow. And Paul said, Gentiles don't even do this. This is fornication. He clearly calls it out. This is fornication. This is an incestuous relationship. He said it's common. Everybody knows it. Commonly reported. Verse 2. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, your glory is not good. Know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. What did he say? He said, you're tolerating this. <coughs> You're permitting this man to be in your assembly and to go along as though nothing has happened. You've swept it under the rug. You've ignored it. You may not have, you may not have told him it's okay. You may not have accepted it the way it is or encouraged it. But by the fact that you're ignoring it, the fact that you have not drawn attention to it, the fact that you've not disciplined him as a member of your body, you're permitting it. You're tolerating it. What does he say? He says, you purge out the old leaven. He says, you deliver that one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What does he mean? He means you disfellowship that individual. You have no fellowship with him at all. You tell him he's wrong. If he don't repent, then you disfellowship him. So that he understands this is not an action that's going to be tolerated. Not only for the saving of his soul, as Paul says, but for the benefit of the entire congregation. This can't be allowed to go on in your midst. But we do this a lot, don't we? We ignore something. And by ignoring it, we're inadvertently permitting it. And we may we don't call it out, we don't want to have anything to do with it, maybe. Because of that, people see us as accepting it. Church was tolerating and permitting an incestuous relationship. Again, maybe they were trying to sweep it under the rug. Maybe they didn't want to disturb the peace of the congregation. Maybe they were afraid to confront the man. I don't know. But their lack of action was turned to acceptance of this sin. The same was true of the church at Thyatira Tyre in Revelation 2 and 20. I'm not going to read that for sake of time. But that church, Jesus wrote a letter to them, and he told them they were allowing fornication and false doctrine to be taught in the church. And he said, I hate that. Because they were allowing this to go on. You can read it for yourself. We can't just go along to get along. In our personal lives, in the church, whatever. We must condemn sin. We must take a stand. We must hate, detest, and abhor sin just like Jesus. And I think this is the most dangerous level for us. We can get, it's very easy for us to get right here in the world that we live in. Afraid. To take a stand. And because of that... We accept it. But finally, finally, we prohibit sin. We prohibit it. We prohibit sin. 
We speak against it. We condemn it in no uncertain terms as the Apostle Paul did. We don't fellowship it. We don't give it any room to cultivate at all. This is true morally, but it's also true doctrinally. You know, in the first century, after Paul returned from the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas come back to Antioch, and the Bible says they rehearsed all that had been done. Remember, they converted a whole lot of Gentiles when they were on that trip on that first missionary journey. When they get back to Antioch, the Bible says in Acts 15, I'm not going to read it for sake of time, but the Bible says in Acts 15 that when they get back, that brethren from Jerusalem, remember, Jerusalem was headed by the apostles. Over 12 apostles living at Jerusalem. Brethren from Jerusalem came up to Antioch and they taught the church there that unless you were circumcised, you couldn't be saved. Why did they do this? Because Antioch was a church made up of Jews and Gentiles. And all those Gentiles, no doubt, weren't circumcised. And Paul and Barnabas had just returned from this trip teaching a bunch of Gentiles that no doubt weren't circumcised. And so they came up there to straighten Paul out. They came up there to straighten Barnabas out and to straighten that church out. You think Paul went along with that? You think Paul accepted that? You think he, uh, he just ignored their teaching for the sake of peace? Just to go along? No. Not at all. Paul was fired up. When they came up there teaching that, he was fired up. And this is what the Bible says in Acts 15 and verse, I'm just going to read verse 2. It says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. What did the Bible say? It said, Paul, I love the King James Version that works thing. He made no small dissension and disputation with them. No small one. It wasn't a small one. It was a big one. It was an ordeal. When they got up and talked this, Paul shut it down. He wasn't going to allow them to teach this false doctrine at all because it was wrong. It was sinful. This teaching wasn't right. Where'd they come from? They come from Jerusalem. Now, a lot of people say that they went down, that Paul and the church in Antioch went down to, to Jerusalem to work out this problem and to try to find a middle ground. No, that's not what happened. You know why Paul went to, the, went to Jerusalem in Acts 15? He went down there to set the apostles straight. He went down there to tell the apostles that you are wrong. <laughs> and you're tolerating this teaching in your church. You allowed these guys to come up here to Antioch and teach this. And you're all wrong. And it's not right. And we have this recorded in Galatians, the second chapter. We have Paul's explanation of this, and I love what he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. This is his account of what happened. Now, Acts 15 is Luke's account. Galatians 2 is what Paul says about this. He says, Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. You know why he took Titus? Because Titus wasn't circumcised. He was a Gentile. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run and run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So I took Titus. <coughs> and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. He says, I didn't give him space for a minute because this was wrong and I wasn't going to tolerate it. You know what he did? He straightened Peter out. And he straightened James out. And he straightened John out because they were allowing a false teaching. Now let me ask you a question. What if Paul hadn't done that? This question might still be controversial today. Because evidently Paul was the only one that was willing to stand up and say, this teaching is wrong. It's not right. We're not going to allow it. It's contrary to God's will. It's wrong. And you know what? They agreed with him. And the question was settled forever, wasn't it? It's not a question today, is it? No. 
Why is it not a question? Because the Apostle Paul didn't give him space for an hour. He was going to make sure it was right. Listen, if we don't stand up against things that are wrong, who's going to? Who's going to? If we don't say some actions are wrong, who's going to stand up and condemn it? And I'm talking about with moral issues. I'm talking about with worship issues. I'm talking about whatever. You know, I don't know who it was a hundred years ago in this area that refused, maybe 150 years ago, that refused to allow instruments of worship in here. I don't know who did that. But I'm thankful they did. I'm thankful they stood up and they said, this isn't right. This isn't according to the New Testament pattern. I don't know who it was several years ago that said this is the pattern for the Lord's Supper that we have to observe. This is the way it should be done. I don't know who did that. But you know what? A lot of people didn't do that. A lot of people just went along to go along. J.W. McGarvey lived in the Restoration Room. He knew Alexander Campbell. And he went along with instrumental music. Now, he, he said it was... J.W. McGarvey was right here. He was right about, I'd say he's right about right there on instrumental music. He didn't like it. He said it wasn't right. But you know what he did? He fellowshiped those that accepted it. And eventually, everyone around him, through the space of time, was immersed in it and practicing it. Because... He, re he didn't refuse to fellowship them. Why can't you just go along and get along? Why can't you just go along and get along with this issue, that issue? We can't just go along and get along. If it's wrong, we've got to condemn it as wrong. If it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And we've got to do that which is right. Edmund Burke said this, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil you can set the word wrong in there, whatever you want to do. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. That's why we have to call out something that's wrong. That's why we can have zero tolerance for sin, whether it be morally, whether it be doctrinally, whatever the issue is. We cannot accept it. We've got to prohibit it and condemn it. Well, I'm ready to close this morning, but we never want to close to accept an invitation. If you're here and you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to become a Christian. What's your level of acceptance with Jesus Christ? Where are you at on this chart right here? Where are you with your level of acceptance of Jesus Christ? You know, some people are down here. Let's take that sin off for just a second, and let's think about your life. Some people are down here. They don't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. Maybe they think he's a fake, he's a phony, nothing to it. No, I'm not having anything to do at all with Jesus Christ. Yeah, I don't want anything to do with it. Maybe you're there. You might be right here. Where I, you know, take it or leave it. Doesn't really matter. Christianity, Jesus, God, eh, whatever. Maybe you're right here. Maybe you think it's a good thing. Maybe you think Christianity is a good lifestyle. And hey, you know, that's good. I'm glad. Uh, and maybe even you promote Christianity and, and come to service and, and you do whatever to promote Christianity. But you don't necessarily practice it. But you think it's good. You're for it. You're not against it. And then, of course, people here that are faithful Christians that fully accept it. That are fully engaged in the Christian life. That are fully submissive to the will of Jesus. Where are you at? Remember God and Jesus hate sin. The devil was prepared, the hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. But also for those that are fully immersed or immersed in a sinful lifestyle, not covered by the blood of Jesus. That's where we'll end up if we don't obey the gospel. We come to Jesus by faith, believing that he's the Son of God. Faith, trust, confidence. It's up here. <coughs> Repenting, changing your life, fully accepting it, getting rid of the past, 
getting rid of all those bad activities, and adding the good things. Jesus said, we don't repent, we'll perish. Confessing him as the Son of God, I'm ashamed of the prayer that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and based upon that confession, being baptized, being immersed in water for the remission of your sins, contacting the blood of Jesus, being washed, being made white, pure. New creature. Remember the body of Christ. You've never done that.